Patrick McDonald, who's the golf writer at CBS Sports, joins us. And a warm welcome to the show, Patrick. Really looking forward to having a chat. Martin, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, it's, it's a good time in the world of golf. It's brilliant, isn't it? And so much attention, obviously, on Tiger Woods every time he plays. Uh, he finished 45th on the weekend. But more, more, I suppose, the focus being on his, his leg. Can he get himself around a golf course? Can he, can he keep you know, sustaining four or five rounds at a time? And then, obviously, his playing future. So, look, I'll let you explain it all. Yeah, I, I mean, you hit it. You hit it uh, right, right on the, the nail, right? It's it's really his health status. What can Tiger Woods do during the weekend? We saw glimpses of kind of both ends of the spectrum there at Riviera. Uh, that final or that first round, those final three holes, birdie, birdie. You see him do something like that, and you think to yourself, you know, holy crap, is it 2006 again? Could this guy's Right, and it's you kind of want to turn away almost. It's it's cringeworthy at times when you know he's grimacing with some pain, and then you know here comes Saturday, four under sixty three. Only John Rahm and Denny McCarthy had a better round than him in the third round at Riviera. So I think that's kind of the norm with Tiger Woods these days. You're going to have moments where you will convince yourself you'll do the mental gymnastics of holy crap, this guy could win another major championship. Heck. Maybe he could beat Jack Nicholas's record. And then you're going to have rounds like Friday and Sunday where you kind of want to look away and the leg doesn't look great. But I, I think there is a path for Tiger Woods to kind of play himself into contention here. And it, it really has to do with the tee times. Uh, like you said at the top, it's really all about his health and kind of keeping that leg in check. And so if he has an early Thursday morning tee time, a late Friday morning, and he has two of those good rounds in those first two rounds where – He'll get a full day of rest on Saturday. Maybe that'll be enough to keep him afloat. And then into Sunday, anything can happen on the PGA Tour, as we know. I think that's the path you got to look at if you're a Tiger Woods fan. Patrick, that's fascinating. Do you think then that organisers of tournaments would deliberately schedule his rounds along those lines? I mean, look, and I, and I draw the parallel with uh, Grand Slam tennis, where you know there's been a lot of talk about Roger Federer and the draws that he got, and you know compared to other players and favourable draws, and that you know would you know would do you do you think that that, that they would actually make that point of doing that? Yeah, I, I think a hundred percent. I I think for the most part. Uh, just with the TV here in the States, Tiger Woods is going to play Friday afternoon, right? It, it's for, it's good for ratings. It's good for TV. That's when people will get off work for the weekend. So uh, it didn't happen just because he was the host of this tournament. But I think moving forward, you're going to see a lot of Tiger Woods early on Thursday, late on Friday. His best, most complete performance since the car crash. So obviously the next question is, you know, is he going to compete again ahead of the Masters? And how many times will we see him outside of those major tournaments? Yeah, I think if you listen to Tiger, uh, I mean, he's been pretty blunt, pretty to the point where it's going to be these major championships and then maybe one or two other tournaments throughout the year. And if you think about it, he kind of already knocked off one of those with the Genesis Invitational. So conventional wisdom would suggest it'll either be the arnold palmer invitational where we know his record there i think he's won eight times uh at bay hill or the players championship which is a relatively easy walk flat golf course but uh in my opinion and if if i had to put money on it i I don't really think we'll we'll see him again until augusta uh you know a few of my coworkers and other writers think that he'll play the players championship just because him and rory mcroy had kind of been this, you know, spearheading this new PGA Tour, kind of the new figureheads, uh, pseudo commissioner, so to speak. But uh, for my money, I don't think we'll see him until Augusta. But at the same time, maybe he surprises us there at TPC Sawgrass. Look, when you say that, I'd actually, that, that had kind of just momentarily slipped my mind. The fact that, you know, we've still got Live Golf, we've still got the PGA Tour, that Tiger and Rory have really stood up big time for the PGA Tour. So I suppose if, you know, they're going to cut him some slack. I mean, you know, there's every reason why they why they perhaps should, especially at the moment. Yeah, exactly, right? I mean, if you're Jay Monahan, the head of the PGA Tour, and, and you're looking at the last two weeks of golf, I don't think you could have scripted it any better, right, with kind of the Scheffler versus Rom there in Phoenix. And then you have the Tiger Mania in L.A. in addition to Rom versus Homa. So, look, the TV here in the States or and internationally, they're always going to put Tiger Woods on the TV no matter what. I mean, his crowds on Sunday were bigger than Rom's and Homa's and Mitchell's in that final group when he was, you know, 12 shots out of the lead or something like that. So 
they'll do anything to keep Tiger on the course, you know, anything beneficial for him. I'm, I'm sure it's definitely, at, you know, 1A, 1B on Jay Monahan's list. Pedro McDonald is with us, golf rider at CBS Sports. Look, I'll just get you to stand still at the moment and speak up nice and loud because I kind of am, am, am losing you a little bit, if that's okay. Yep. Um, so his best, most complete performance, he shoots his lowest single round, 10 birdies, one eagle. It's it's there, isn't it? I mean, like, you know, obviously, you know, he, he hasn't lost it. He's still Tiger Woods, but can he be Tiger Woods for a major championship? Yeah, I think that's the million-dollar question, right, Martin? Uh, I mean, we saw glimpses of it even last year at Augusta when he opened with an under-par round. Uh, he went into the weekend just outside the top 10 there on the leaderboard. But, you know, granted, Scotty Scheffler was winning, running away with the tournament, so he was out of reach. So I think you're going to see kind of the same situation we saw at Riviera, but maybe a different combination of it where I wouldn't be surprised if he shoots something like a 68-67 to open at Augusta, you know, a la Freddie Couples a, a decade ago, and you, you get all the, the memories flowing and you think, what if? Uh, but I just don't think he can compete with the guys like John Rahm or Scotty Scheffler or Rory McIlroy over the course of four rounds, let alone the second-tier guys, whether that be a, a Max Homa or a Will Zalatoris or a Colin Morikawa. So uh, I, I think we all want to believe he has another one in him, and I think he'll kind of flash at major championships every now and again, but I just don't see him getting uh, to number 16. All right, Patrick, let's look at this Netflix doco, Full Swing, which is a golf version pretty similar to F1's Drive to Survive. All episodes are out now. Any observations so far about this series from you? Uh, well, for one, I wasn't in it, so uh, <laughs> that, that was a bit of a letdown. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I, I think, you know, you got to realize, a, a lot of my counterparts need to realize as well that this isn't really for – the die hard golf fan, right? We pretty much know exactly what happened this past year in golf. It's more so try to attract the new fan, try to, you know, bring more eyes to the game. Uh, so I think it does a pretty good uh, job at that. I think you see in the first episode, they're explaining what par is. Uh, they, they mention a lot how a PGA tour tournament works with a 36 hole cut, where if you miss the cut, you don't make any money. So I think from that respect, that they do a good job explaining to people who might not be too familiar with golf. But, you know, for someone like myself who's been close to it, who pretty much knew everything that was already going to happen, uh, it was an okay watch. I, I didn't mind it. I thought the insight into Joel Damon's relationship with his caddy was very cool. Tony Finau kind of balancing being a father uh, and a husband while, you know, going on that tear he went on last summer was was a good watch as well. So if you're not a golf fan, I definitely recommend it. And even if you are, I recommend it as well. Look, F1 started at golf. There's tennis now and Six Nations rugby as well. So it, it, it just seems, I suppose it's like everything. Once, once one is successful, everyone else jumps at it and says, okay, well, look, you know, you're attracting a new crowd to your sport. Maybe it can actually help us. You know, do you think that, you know, because F1 has taken off in the United States because of this, supposedly it's got a much renewed interest and, and a much different demographic of fans and people wanting to follow the sport. You know, is that is that the point of this? And, and, and what kind of possibility that it, that it will do the same? I, I think that's the goal, but I, I don't know if it'll be successful in that. I mean, then again, you think about F1, like it's life-defying. I mean, these guys are going a zillion miles per hour. And at the end of the day, you know, I cover golf for a living. I think it's the most interesting in the thing in the world. But at the end of the day, to the common person, is, is golf really that interesting? Uh, I mean, it, it's a slow sport. Uh, it, it's certainly not like F1 or tennis or rugby. Uh, so I, I think it'll fall short of expectations, but uh, maybe that's just like you said. I mean, you see one one sport be successful in it. I think it's hard for the other sports to follow suit, especially with golf, where it, it is pretty much worldwide at this point. Yeah, I mean, and also it's reality TV. So what are they looking for? They're looking for conflict. They're looking for personalities. They're looking for something that they can make controversial. Um, and obviously the Live Golf versus PGA. I mean, that was kind of a godsend for the television makers of this, surely. Yeah, I, I can't really imagine how the season would have gone uh, if Liv didn't pop up, right? Uh, you, you had the episode with Ian Poulter, uh, which I found to be one of the more interesting ones. And then the one with Brooks Kepka as well. Uh, where he essentially said his body's breaking down. He doesn't know how much longer he has playing. He can't compete with the Scotty Scheffler types. 
and he essentially grabbed the money. Uh, so like you said, it is reality TV and it felt like kind of those rivalries and butting heads, you know, Rory kind of making fun of Phil there in the last episode as well. Uh, th- that's what people want to see. And you kind of saw that with, you know, a Max Verstappen versus Lewis Hamilton kind of rivalry butting heads there as well. Uh, but you know, now you look at the PGA tour just by itself, it, it, there really aren't any villains, so to speak. There's no Patrick Reed, there's no Bryson, there's no Brooks. Uh, it's really just John Rahm who I guess you, you might be able to stretch to him becoming a villain, but at the same time, he's the best player in the world by far. Well, a couple of quick questions before we go, and that was going to be one of them. Who right now is the best player in the world as far as you're concerned? It's Rahm? It's not, uh, it's not uh, McElroy? Uh, it's, I think it's undisputable, Rom. I, I don't think you can really put him and Rory next to each other at this point. I, for the longest time, right, for the past, I don't know, since August, it was 1A, 1B, in my opinion, interchangeable with Rory winning the FedEx Cup and as well as the DP uh, World Tour Championship uh, season-long race. So, you know, going up, you know, into 2023, I, I'd say 1A, 1B. But what Rom has done this year is actually – just bonkers Uh, i think you've seen all the the references and statistics where from a strokes gained wise there is no one else above him outside of tiger wood peak tiger woods right now how he's performing uh you have the win at kapalua you have the win at the american it expressed the win at riviera so three wins uh you know already in 2023 five in his last nine starts and it really came back to the fedex cup playoffs uh in wilmington the bmw championship i asked him about his putting and he switched something on the second nine in his second round and ever since he's been averaging about 1.1 strokes gain putting per round which is ridiculous lucas herbert led the pga tour last year you know about half of that and john rom has been sustaining that for half a year Uh, he said you know if i putt this well throughout the course of a pga tour season i might win eight times and it looks like he's on that way Finally, obviously, and not finally, I mean, you know, we have to talk about Lydia Ko as well, who started the season off like an absolute rocket, number one in the world again, wins in the Saudi, uh, pockets a huge amount of money for it. Where, 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 is, where do you see her future going this year? And can she start reclaiming some of those major titles herself? You have to imagine, especially coming off the, you know, the end of last year she had and just winning in Saudi, like you said. And the thing about Lydia Ko that always surprises me for some reason is just how young she is. It, it feels like she's been around here just for so long. And I mean, she's still only 25 years of age, which is ridiculous. That's younger than me. And I, like, I, I can't believe it. So uh, the, the women's game's in a good place. You see Nellie Corda, Brooke Henderson playing well as well. But I think right now Lydia Ko is kind of a tier above them, uh, almost a John Rom type uh, in the women's game. And yeah, you'd have to imagine reclaiming major titles. Uh, maybe the Evian will be in her future.